The first really useful bit of information is this, that a character is a construct. Authors construct their characters, they make them, they fashion them in order to get over their point of view and their message. And as soon as you start using this phrase, you automatically jump up the mark scheme, at least to grade six. Now, the opening stage directions are really useful because they try to show us what's wrong with each character. And remember the stage directions are primarily for the actors and the director because as the audience, we don't see them directly. However, we'll see the results of them and that will help us understand what's going on. So he wants us to understand that Burling's authority is questionable. For example, Burling and Gerald are in the same family business. They're both textile factory owners. However, Croft's wealth is probably inherited. We find out that Lady Croft does not approve of Gerald's marriage to Sheila because he would be marrying into a family that is less upper class. So when Priestley creates Burling, he isn't creating a particularly upper class character. He's creating a hard headed man of business. Now, this is important because that represents capitalism, people who have made profits out of the wars. To Priestley's audience in 1945, he meant the people who've made profits out of the First World War and the Second World War. Now, what's wrong with capitalism isn't that they want to make a profit. What's wrong with capitalism is it makes a profit at the expense of working class people who are not paid a fair wage and don't get fair working or even safe working conditions. Now, this is why structurally he begins with Burling and it's why Burling is the focus of the beginning of the play with the inspector because he wants to discredit capitalism. The stage directions tell us that Burling is heavy looking. Now, this is really interesting because it means the actor has to move very slowly, he's probably fat, and this symbolically helps personify him as greed. Remember, each character represents one of the seven deadly sins. This will also put Burling in direct contrast with the inspector, who is going to be described as massive. But he's not massive in size. He's massive in impact and in character and in the way he behaves. In contrast, Burling's heaviness shows that he's self-satisfied and actually slow. He's lumbering. This will actually slow him down physically on stage, which will make it easier for us to realize that his predictions which are coming up are stupid and wrong. And that will make it easier for Priestley to show that Burling's actions in sacking Eva in the first place are stupid and wrong. And then every other action he takes in the play we'll see in the same light. He also gives this instruction that Burling should be rather portentous. It means full of himself and able to see portents, to see into the future. And as you know, all he predicts in the future is completely wrong, from the sinking of the Titanic to the Germans not wanting war. So the audience are laughing at him, and that's important because it means they can then laugh at his capitalist views, and in particular, the views about exploiting workers. Most students forget this bit, which is really important. He is rather provincial in his speech. That means he speaks with a local accent. He's not posh. He doesn't sound like a member of the upper classes. Now, that's important because it brings us back to the idea of businessmen, people who are profiting out of war and exploiting others. This portrays him as a capitalist. It makes him different from Gerald, who has inherited his wealth. He's also a capitalist, but what he suffers from is also being a member of the upper class and therefore feeling entitled. Priestley wants us to see a parallel between Sybil Burling and her husband and Sheila and Gerald. Gerald is older than Sheila, in the same way that Burling is in his mid-50s compared to his wife, who is nearly 50. Now, the reason that Priestley does this is he's saying, look, what we want when we watch this play is for Sheila to have a different life 
to Sybil Burling and Burling. But when we get to the end of the play, that's called into question. And so this stage direction about the casting asks us to wonder if Sheila can escape the influence of her parents or whether in the future she will turn out just like them even though she's learnt the inspector's lesson. And that can only happen if, as a woman in a patriarchal society, she cannot achieve power and authority, and therefore, despite her views, isn't able to change the future. Now, Sybil is definitely not a capitalist. She is a member of the upper classes. We're told she is her husband's social superior, and Priestley links that deliberately with her being a cold woman. His point is that when you have a class system, those who are superior in the hierarchy of the class system automatically think they are superior to other people and therefore they treat other people as less than human. They treat them much more like objects. They treat them coldly. Now, not only does Sheila have the advantage of being born into a wealthy and influential family, she's also pretty, which makes her marriageable, which in a patriarchal society means she's likely to be successful because she's going to attract a wealthy partner. She's very pleased with life and rather excited. Now, when Priestley calls her a girl and excited, he is belittling her, he's making her out to be immature, and we'll see her mature during the course of the play. However, she's still going to be in her early 20s, and she's still going to be faced with this idea of marrying Gerald. And so at the back of our minds is the worry that actually she might revert to what she was at the beginning of the play. The description of Gerald Croft makes us suspicious of him. He is an attractive chap, about 30, so we're on side with him. He's got film star good looks, but he is rather too manly to be a dandy. Now, the word rather was a criticism when it referred to Sheila earlier. She was rather excited, was criticising her for not being a serious human being. There's also the implication that Gerald puts himself about. He is a very well-bred young man about town. Well-bred is a signifier that he's a member of the upper classes. And what Priestley is suggesting here is that those who have inherited wealth and a feeling of entitlement go about town in, <laughs> in order to attract women. They expect people to women to fall over heels in love with them because they are so eligible, they're so wealthy, and they have so much status. And therefore, they can treat these women with an element of contempt, which is what we see with Gerald Croft. He says he loves Sheila, but actually we find out he's been having this affair with Daisy Renton, Eva, for many, many months. And he doesn't seem to feel any guilt about deceiving his fiancée in this way. Calling Gerald a chap is also very revealing, because when we get to Eric, we'll find out that Eric doesn't take responsibility for forcing himself on Eva. He just says he was in the state where a chap turns nasty, as though, well, all men are like this, aren't they? Don't blame me. This is a way for him to avoid responsibility. And this description of Gerald as a chap implies that he has laddish behaviour. He behaves like all the other upper-class entitled men in society and is therefore dangerous to women. Now, the inspector will later claim that uh, Gerald, at least, did some good to Eva, which is really interesting because I think he is the worst character and that he exploits her most. You know, at least Eric tries to put things right and he's willing to marry Eva and bring up his child, but Gerald just discards her. Now, one of the interesting things about Priestley is that he too was a man about town. I mean, he didn't come from an upper-class background, but he just saw it as his right to have affairs with people even when he was married. And in later life, he said he enjoyed the physical relations with the sexes without the feelings of guilt which seems to disturb some of my distinguished colleagues. So even as an older man, he doesn't see anything wrong with having extramarital affairs. And in some ways, he doesn't blame Gerald. And that's why the inspector doesn't blame Gerald. But that doesn't mean that we don't have to blame Gerald, and I certainly do. So we might ask, how is Eric constructed? What does he represent? Well, Eric is in his early 20s, and, and as a result, he represents 
wealthy men of that age who have been to universities like Oxford and Cambridge. They've got an education, but they're not really sure what to do with themselves in society. And this lack of awareness of what their future is going to be is revealed in Eric, where he is not quite at ease, he's half shy, and he's half assertive. This helps us see him as immature, he's still young, but we also have a little bit of sympathy for him because he's obviously struggling with his position in life, highly educated, but having to work for his father and be under his father's influence. Now, this is relevant in 1912 because it's Burling's generation who went to war and then sent off not themselves, but their sons, and those sons went off to die. They would have been the officer class, the people who, if you know your history, would have been leading over the top, over the trenches, into no man's land, into the wall of machine gun fire. And obviously, if you're a German soldier, who are you going to try and pick out? You're going to kill the leaders as quickly as you can. And so actually, Eric's generation, those upper class and rich and wealthy males, were the ones who were most likely to die in the First World War. Now that's relevant, remember, because the inspector says that if they don't learn his lesson, they'll learn it in fire and blood and anguish. It's a direct reference to the First World War that's coming in 1914, and of course to the Second World War, where they learn the lesson again in 1939. And who are going to be the victims of that? People of Eric's age and Gerald's age. They're the ones who are going to be slaughtered on the Western Front. Now, the stage directions which tell us how the characters are sitting are also really revealing. Normally, we would expect the head of the household, Arthur Burling, to be sitting with his wife, but instead they're put at opposite ends of the table. His audience would know that this was highly unusual, and it would signal one of two possibilities. One, that Arthur Burling is in opposition with his wife, or she is in opposition to him. That's the class divide, remember, and that might exist even in their own marriage. The other possibility is that they are both in positions of power and authority, and they're acting in a kind of pincer movement on their own children. They are suppressing their own children, which will help explain why they are not able to influence the future at the end of the play. Because symbolically, the second death occurs, and as you know if you've been watching my videos, that second death represents the Second World War that should have been prevented by the horror of the First World War, but because the lessons weren't learnt, the Second World War happened again. And that's now happening here, symbolically, because the older generation have suppressed the younger generation and denied them power, authority and influence. Now, if Burling had been the head of the table and everyone else was sat round it, there would be no odd person out. But sitting them like this means Eric is on his own on one side of the table, while Sheila and Gerald are on the other side. This isolates Eric, and it helps us realise that he is the odd one out, not just in the family, but the one who is going to be perceived as having done the worst to Eva. He is the one who has forced himself upon her, then he's got her pregnant, and then he's committed the crime of stealing from his parents. He's also the odd one out in that he's not in control of himself, he's an alcoholic. And so this seating arrangement right at the beginning of the play asks us to focus on Eric and wonder whether he is the person most responsible for the death of Eva Smith. And Eva's death shows that she rejects Eric. So in her mind, he is also the worst person because after all, she could have accepted his proposal of marriage, but instead she chooses to reject everything, including Eric's child. We might say especially Eric's child, because of how much she detests Eric for what he's done to her. Now, you can access all this text for free by clicking on the link to my newsletter below. And if you prefer video, that's lucky, because the next video gives you the best character analysis of every single character in the play, and it guarantees you grade 9 understanding. Check it out. It's coming up now.